Good evening, good evening, good evening, and welcome to Let's Study the Word. We come one more time into the presence of God so that we can be considered rightly dividing the word of truth. Because the Bible tells us that only those who seek his face can use that sentence truthfully. So as we come this evening, I want to thank you for wanting to spend some time with me. And I just ask you even now, have your Bibles close by. Have your notebook close by. Have your pens close by. Because we're going into the Word to study so that we can be considered approved. Let us pray and seek the face of the Lord as we go into this evening's lesson. Heavenly Father, we want to give you thanks for your mercy and for your grace. We want to give you thanks for your loving kindness. We want to bless you, mighty God, for indeed you are the all-sufficient one and there is none like unto you. You are Jireh, more than enough. Your provider, your friend, your keeper. You're the lover of our souls. You are the one who removes the spirit of bondage and oppression and depression and puts upon us the joy of your salvation. You are the one who dresses us in the raiments with the garments of praise and removes the spirit of heaviness. And this evening, Lord, we want to thank you for being God, for there's none like unto you. There is none to compare to you. And Lord, we want to bless you and glorify you in everything we do this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Good evening, everyone. Welcome one more time to Let's Study the Word. And we're here this evening to go into the Word of God because I believe he has something special for us tonight. And sometimes in order for God to get me to the place where I understand that the word he wants me to bring across, he carries me there. And let me tell you, this has been an interesting week for me, a, a week of hurt, a week of pain, a week of tears, a week that I would not like to repeat, but only having gone through that week, am I able to truly give justice to this word. I'm going to ask you to turn in your Bibles. We're looking at two sets of scriptures tonight. We're looking at just a few verses from St. Matthew chapter 6. And I really do hope that you open your Bibles and read the word with me tonight. Because I think it is important. And we're starting at verse 25. St. Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. This is one of the easiest scriptures to find because it's the first book of the New Testament. And it reads thus. Therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body what ye shall put on it. Is not the life more than meat and the body more than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, neither do they gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father aided them. Are you not more important? I want you to underline that. Are you not more important? Are ye not much better than they are? Mm. Which of you by taking thought can add one cubit onto his statue? <laughs> when you're worried, can you add one measure to your day, one moment more to your life? And look at verse 28. And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, Shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And 
all these things shall be added unto you. Let's read the final verse. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient until the day is the evil thereof. I want you to then turn in your Bibles to a quick one now in St. Luke chapter 7. St. Luke chapter 7, and we'll be reading verses 11 to 16. And it came to pass the day after that he went into a city called Nain, and many of his disciples went with him, and much people. And when he came nigh to the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And much people of the city was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said unto her, Weep not. And he came and he touched the briar, and they that bare it stood still, and he said, Young man, I say unto thee, Arise. And he that was dead sat up and began to speak, and he delivered him to his mother. And there came a fear on all. And they glorified God, saying that a great prophet is risen up among us and that God had visited his people. If I was to give thought to a topic for tonight, it would be the compassionate God. The compassionate God. I want to take time this evening to go slow because I believe this topic is worthy of note. As I gave thought to what I'll be ministering on, and usually I start thinking about what I'm going to minister on from the Sunday, I kept being drawn to this idea, this thought of this God who loves us beyond measure. This God who sat down and took time to put into place a plan that would redeem sinful man back onto himself. This God who so loved the world that he knew the price that would have to be paid to reconcile man unto himself. And it was a price he paid and paid willingly. He paid the price because he felt that that relationship he wanted with man was worthy of it. Think about it for a moment. If you went to the market and you saw something and it didn't look all that good and they were offering it for a high price, would you buy it? Let's say that it was some ripe bananas and it's all bruised and dark skinned and battered and looks soft in areas. And you're not buying it to make anything like uh, fritters or so on. You're buying it to eat it as a fruit. And you look at it and the gentleman said to you, hey, I am willing to sell this one hand of banana, 12 bananas on the hand. He says, I'm willing to sell you this one hand of banana for $1,000. Would you buy it? I dare to guess that many of you would say no, because no, that's too high a price to pay something that's bruised and battered. If you are giving it for free, yeah, I'd probably take it then, but I'm not going to spend my hard worn money to pay so much. And we've got to do this in context because you may be watching this broadcast from another nation. In our nation, one week of minimum wage, meaning that the minimum you can earn is someone getting $9,000. So if this person takes $1,000 out of that 9,000, they would have used one ninth of their entire week's salary to buy a dozen bananas. Is it worth it? It doesn't look that way. But here is God looking on man, stricken, broken, bound for death and hell. Man not having any worth, not being very good. Man being the first opportunity they got a killer. Man being the first opportunity they got wanting to usurp God by building a city towards the, the sky. Man being so wicked and, and angry and hurtful that God wants to use a flood to cleanse the earth. 
Yeah, that, that man that, that is so sinful and so unjust that when God decided to give laws, he had to command them not to kill each other. Yeah, that, that type of man, bruised, battered, not in good condition. And the price to rescue this man, to restore him into good positioning, to move him from bruised and battered to good standing, is giving up his pure son. Part of the triune Godhead, one who knew no sin, one who did nothing to deserve this, giving him up, and not just giving him up to earth, but giving him up to earth and putting him in the hands of the same sinful man. And to have man beat and whip and bloody and crucify his son. It wasn't an easy death. It wasn't a shot to the heart. It, it wasn't just one stab. It was lashes upon lashes. His body crisscrossed. His head bleeding from the crown of thorns. It was the blood rushing through his veins and pouring out because in this battered position, he carries a cross. And he walks miles upon miles upon miles. And when he's thirsty, they give him vinegar to drink. You got to understand that from the Garden of Eden, God knew this was going to be the story. But the compassionate God loved us enough that he wrote the story so that it could have the end, to have man reconciled unto himself. That's the compassionate God who loves us beyond measure, who, who loves us to a point where he would give of himself so that we could have life and have it more abundantly. That's the greatest example of compassion I believe we can tell. But I wanted to look at it from another standpoint tonight. Because sometimes we accept the gift, we accept the law, and we come into the kingdom. I'm going slowly. And when we come into the kingdom, we come with an expectation in our hearts that all will now be well. We come with an expectation that our lives will be aligned with the master and we are the victors and we are certainly not victims. And so we have an expectation as to how our lives would go. But one of the things we forget is that there is one who cometh to kill, steal, and to destroy. There is one who comes and his all aim and determination is to create a, a deviation, to create a disruption, to create a problem. Imagine that God views us as his bride and he is the groom. And there is a neighbor who hates this relationship, hates the beauty of what they have. Here is this, this neighbor who looks at this marriage and detests everything that they see. Or to put it in another scenario, imagine a broken relationship between a man and a woman and the woman leaves and the man finds another woman. Another woman that he says, I love you enough to make you my bride. I will forget how hurt I was with the former relationship and I want to betroth myself to you. I want to give myself to you. I want to take care of you. I want to love on you. And the woman who broke off before, who had betrayed the man before, the one who had cheated on the man before, comes and he sees this relationship and how beautiful it was and he's so jealous that that person decides, look, 
I'm going to do everything in my power to disrupt this relationship. I'm going to tear this relationship apart. And so they inject themselves into the relationship and they say, what can I do to tear it apart? And they may call the wife and they may call the husband and they may do things to create friction. Well, you've got to understand that that was the story that Satan depicts. For he was once in heaven and he was so beautiful, he was called the morning star. And he was so wonderful in his praise and in his worship that there was none like unto him. He was a cherubim. Until he determined in himself, like Vashti did, that I am not going to respond anymore to the king. I'm going to do things my way. And then if it wasn't bad enough, he says, look here, I'm going to take over the throne. And God says, you've gone too far. And God kicks him out of heaven and there's a rebellion. And one third of the angels in heaven sided with Satan and ended up being ejected from heaven. And when they saw the relationship that God ensued with man, Come, let us make man in our own image and in our own likeness. Come, let's give man dominion, authority, and power. Come, man, let's reason together. Come, man, let, let, let's, when we talk, we have a relationship, a beautiful thing to be envisioned. And Satan says, hold up, that's what I used to have. I don't like this. I don't like this. I got to disrupt this. I got to break this. I got to make God see that man is just as bad as I am. I got to inject myself into the situation and go whisper in man's ear. I got to tell some lies, some things that to break this relationship. And that's what he did in the Garden of Eden. He injected himself in the garden and he started to whisper some sweet nothings. What, don't, don't listen to him. He's just trying to keep things from you. He knows that you're just as powerful as he is if you eat of this tree. Come on over on this side. Come and taste and see. Come, why, don't, why don't you try what I'm saying? And before you know it, man has fallen into sin. Man has fallen away from God. The relationship has been disrupted. And the compassionate God puts his plan into place and into action. Here I am, enjoying the love story. Being baptized into Christ. Being, being part of this family, becoming his bride. Should I really expect that Satan is going to sit on the sidelines and applaud? So this week, as I thought about this message of the compassionate God, I really had to go through some things so that I can understand this message in its fullest. This week, I was betrayed by someone. Not a family member, not, not even a friend, but someone I had trusted. Someone I did certain things for that I felt, well, you know, by doing these things, I should be able to reap the reward of being able to trust the person. Have you trusted somebody? Have you been given into a relationship with somebody and you trusted them? Trusted them maybe with your secrets. Maybe trusted them with your money. Maybe trusted them with your body. Maybe trusted them with your children. Maybe you trusted them with a job. And your trust was betrayed. Have you ever been in a situation where you feel as if you, you can't understand this betrayal, this 
the, the, this hurt, this pain, the why evades you, the why leaves you wondering, how could you? And as I went through, my sisters tried to comfort me and my friends tried to comfort me and they all had good words, but I was hurting. And as I hurt, I poured out my hurt to God. I poured it out and I was saying, Lord, I do not understand how I find myself in this place. And I found myself going into the word to seek an answer, some solace, some comfort. And the human side of me wanted to turn to the Psalms, to turn to Lord will avenge me. It wanted to say, find the scripture that would say that you shall walk upon your enemies. <laughs> you know, that part of you that wants that vindication that God is standing for you. But as I come to the end of the week, I found that what I needed was to be reminded that God loves me. That the God who I have a relationship with will supply all my needs, the good times and the bad. He will provide finances. He will provide food, shelter, and clothing. The God I serve is a compassionate God, and he is touched with the feelings of my infirmities. This week, I came to understand that scripture because I always thought infirmities were just sicknesses and diseases, but this week, I came to the knowledge that infirmities is whatever hurt and pain you're going through, whatever doctor's report was given to you, whatever Whatever came upon your job, whatever circumstances you found yourself in that look so weary and heartbroken, that's your infirmity. And in Luke 7, here it is, this widow. You've got to understand the circumstances here. In those days, women did not really work. Yes, you were the proverbial um, 31 woman and you may put your hands to train but most women did not work and so they were dependent upon their husbands and upon their children that is why the women of those days were so caught up with having sons because in the event of the death of their husbands the sons would still make provisions for them and so here it is, this woman is old and she's gone through life. And as she is walking to the city gates to exit her home, to go outside the city, she carries with her, her legacy, her hope, her provision, she carries with her the child she had born and held in her arms and suckled. She carried with her the child she had doted on. She carried with her the child that when her husband died, she had looked at him and thought to herself, oh, it's going to be okay. She carried her pension and she was carrying them outside the city to leave it. And I can just imagine she wondered, when I come back through these gates, I'm coming back empty. I remember for the first time I could empathize when Naomi said, do not call me sweet, but call me bitter because I left full. 
I had two sons. I had a possibility of hope. I had a future. I left with a husband. I left with a vision. I left with a dream. And now as I come back through the city gates, I'm coming back empty. It's this long walk. I remember when I drove from the church with the body of my mother. I remember when I drove from the church with the body of my father. And it was a long journey to Dubcott, the cemetery place where the bodies would go down. And I remember I kept thinking about all the things that we had gone through together. If you've ever lost someone, that has, those are the things that go through your mind as you move along that procession. And especially if you have no other sons in this era, no father figure, no husband to stand by your side. Coming back, you're wondering, what am I going to do? See, a lot of people accompany you to Dovecott. A lot of people are coming out of the city with her. That's what it says in verse 12. Much people of the city were with her. I don't know whether he was popular or she was popular, but there was a lot of people. And before COVID, there would be hundreds of people following you to the, to the church and hundreds following you to the graveside. But when you're going home, a much quieter event. And she was looking back to go home to poor empty walls and a broken heart, trying to figure out what she was going to do. The Bible says Jesus saw her. I want to tell you today that God sees you. He sees the tears that only you know about. Everybody else looks at you and sees your successes and sees, sees you as standing. They don't know the pain that runs through you at night as you put your head on that pillow and tears wet that pillow. I, I cried every night for this last week. Nobody knew. Because I had to deliver this word to you that God is a compassionate God and he knows and he sees and he understands and he cares for you. He knows the number of hairs on your head. If he cares for the sparrow and the lily of the valleys, how much more? Does he love you? That's what one song team put together, words, the paper, and pen. And that's the word that he wants me to echo in your ears tonight. It does not matter how bleak. It does not matter how distant the journey looks. It does not matter how alone you feel. God says he is going to do it for you. If he dresses the lily of the valley with beauty and splendor, how much more does he love you? I don't know where you are tonight and you're hearing this message. The message for tonight is that the compassionate God is extending his hands towards you because he loves you. There was a particular moment in time when David is being hunted by Saul. His wife has deserted him. 
his brothers. They came with his father and he had to put them up with, with a king in a strange land because he knew Saul was hunting him and he would have killed his brothers and his father if they could. And so David with his 400 men went out into the fields hiding from Saul. And he put pen to paper and reminded himself he reminded himself of the love of God. There was another occasion when, when he sinned against God and when Nathan backed him up as a prophet and told him his sin. And when he saw himself in the mirror of Christ, he cried out and said, Lord, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Let me tell you, God will stay with you through thick and Sin. He will be the lover of your soul if you just give him that opportunity. He's a compassionate God. He's moved by us. He loves us. When he heard that his friend Lazarus had died, the most profound scripture verse follows. It says, Jesus. He knew he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. So why did he weep? He was weeping for Lazarus. He was weeping for us. He was moved that we have to die. Because death is such a wicked thing. And he was moved with compassion. That same compassion he felt here for this widow of man was the compassion he felt upon himself when he considered that I'm going to raise Lazarus. But there are so many more thousands who the sting of death will take. Even Lazarus himself will die again. The compassionate God is concerned about our souls and he's concerned about our hair and he's concerned about our emotions and he's concerned about our feelings and he's here and he's extending his hands towards us and he's saying, come and lay on my breast. Come, come talk to me. And I found that I could not find words. And so I had to resort to tongues this entire week. Because when you speak in tongues, it is from the depths of your being that is crying out in an unknown language to God and connecting with God. So I walked the journey this week. I held on to God. I believed for his word. And every time the enemy closed the door to the circumstances and to the situation and blocked me in a corner, I cried out to God. And God said to me this evening, now you understand I want you to cry out on behalf of my people. So all of you on this program that are alive tonight, tonight I am crying out on behalf of your individual situations. I don't know what they are. I don't know the hurt you're harboring. I don't know the question, that question that you have for God. Why me? Why, why, why? But God says I'm to cry on your behalf. So I'm crying. I'm not crying over my circumstances. I'm not crying over my hurt. I'm no longer crying over my pain. I'm no longer crying over the fact that I feel betrayed. I'm crying on your behalf. I'm interceding on your behalf. 
for I want you to know that your God sees and he knows and he's able to do abundantly more than you can ask or imagine. I want you to know that he is touched with the feelings of your infirmity. I want you to know that he's not forgotten you. That's the message God says to tell his people tonight, that he's not forgotten you. He's still the compassionate God, and he still has you in his thoughts and on his mind. He says, don't give up. Don't let go. Don't let the darkness overtake you. For though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, Fear no ill, for he is with you. The compassionate God is holding you. He's keeping you. That's why you have not faltered and failed. That's why you have not died. That's why you are not at dove cut. That's why you're not buried six foot six. Because the compassionate God is still holding you in the palm of his hands. And he says, I will bear you up. He says, if I love your soul so much that I would send my son to die, do you think I will allow these things, whatever your circumstances, whatever is in your area, whatever your job cry is, do you think God will forget about you? Do you think God will not pay attention? God says, I am here. Can he? But as you go through, it is for your good. For silver and gold has to go through the fire so that they can be purified, so that they can be fashioned, so that they can be baked and made stronger. As one person said, what doesn't kill you make you strong. Tonight I want to let you know. The tears I cry, I cried them for you. The tears I cry, I cried them for your circumstances and your situations. And I decree that God will make a way. He will make a way where there seems to be no way. And he will stand by your side. I want to thank you for joining me on Let's Study the Word. I know that you had many things to do with your evening. The fact that you spared this time with me, I am so grateful. And until next week when we come together again, I do encourage you. Go to the YouTube page, go to the Facebook page. On Facebook, it's Karen Powell. On YouTube, it's Let's Study the Word. Go to the pages and watch a session. Share a session with somebody who may have never watched with us before. Have a watch party. Share the word, make a comment. Do a like and do subscribe. Until next week when we come together again. I love you. I'm praying for you. And I'm crying with you. God bless you.